Sergeant of the Army, Sergeant Major Grinson. Uh, see you, Dave. Okay. We got a full room. Yeah, I am really excited to be back on JBLM. It's, uh, it's been a while. It's really neat. I was like, wow, you know, you wake up and you're going to do good PT. And then you get to see the mountain. So, uh, you know, it's been a while. I, I do have a great view from my house in D.C. I get to see the Lincoln Memorial. I get to see, you know, uh, the Washington Monument, and it's about two miles. It's a great run. Uh, but it's always good to see Mount Rainier. Whenever you get a chance to see that, you don't know how lucky you are until you come here. So uh, whoever did that for me this morning, I really appreciate it. So it's great to be back here. We did good PT. And then we're going to follow up with a panel. So I've done this once before, and I'm really excited. Every time we can talk about this is my squad. So we got a, a lot, some great staff sergeants and sergeants. They're going to tell you a quick story, and then we're going to get some really great dialogue. But before we do all that, I want to talk about what do I mean? You know, what's this, you know, this is my squad. You're like, yeah, you know, we've been talking about this for a while now. Um, maybe not. But this is a culture, kind of a cultural change. And one of the things I want to think of is I want it to be extremely positive. Because everything you do in your squad is positive. But I also want to define what that means to be in your squad. So who's in your squad? Sir, like who's in your squad? Do you have a squad? I have a command team that I work with. Who, so who is that? Okay, there you go. It's not necessarily the squad. So when I said, this is my squad, one time somebody said, Sergeant Major, I'm not in a rifle squad. Okay, you're missing the whole point. You know, the point is, everybody's got a team. A team you're close with that recognizes what's going on with you, and it's not necessarily an infantry squad. It could be. But you may be part of different squads. I am. I've got my squad, part of my squad is the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Secretary of the Army, the Vice Chief of Staff, and the Director of the Army Staff, the DAS. That's my squad. But i got another squad, my wife, my, my daughters. They're in my squad. And it's okay. You might have more than one. It's great. Because you, when you think of my squad, you think of something positive that we do every day to take care of each other. And we do that in multiple ways. Is it's not just about an infantry squad. It's those people that are around you that you're going to look out for. You train them, you build a cohesive fit team, and you can do that at your house. You can do that. Yes, I do build a cohesive fit team at my house too. And daughter's got to go uh, work out. So uh, we do that. And it's not just about an infantry squad. So you have those cohesive teams, and this is the initiative that we all want. This is not just my initiative. This is all of our initiative. So everybody wants a strong, cohesive team that is fit and disciplined. And that's how we're going to go forward with the Army. So I'm really proud to be with you today, and I'm proud to be the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army. Good morning. I'm Staff Sergeant um, Carolina Ruiz. I'm Human Resource Sergeant representing the 2nd ID Devardi Warrior Strike. This is my squad. I'm a caring leader. In order to take ownership of my squad, I must know each individual member of my team. Knowing soldiers builds trust and mutual respect. Communicating effectively builds to this trust and mutual respect. Getting to know my soldiers and their families, like S Sergeant Mejia, who is currently pregnant with their first child, or Specialist Vitas, who has three children. It gets me, it enables me to know my soldiers on a personal level so that I may better understand their values and their connection to the Army. It demonstrates that they are valuable assets within my team and that I'm truly invested in their careers and in their lives. Understanding my soldiers' values can encourage good behavior and enable good habits. My squad 
in, in my squad, we value family. We're very family oriented. We conduct monthly potlucks. We get together, talk about our traditions, talk about the dishes within those traditions and why they're important to us, why, they, why we cook them. Um, we share a meal together. Proper training is important for this mutual trust and respect. One size does not fit all. Everyone has a different style of learning, whether it's hands-on, verbal, logic. Identifying the proper styles of learning for these soldiers are very important so that they have a better understanding of their responsibilities and their duties. I currently have a team leader, Specialist Vitas. She learns through logic. She is in charge of the, my promotion section. I've established a calendar for her with timelines. She's able better to understand the promotion section and she will follow those timelines. She performs her duty efficiently by communicating with me. I notice that she's also a problem solver. If she has a problems or any issues, she'll come to me with the problem, but she always has a solution. On the other hand, I have specialist or PFC Anderson. He's my finance clerk. The style of learning for him is hands-on. So I have to tell him and sit with him and he physically has to go through the motions. Establishing goals within our team is very important, whether it's individual or a team effort. We start with individual goals and then establish our team goals. It brings the team together to work for a common good. It enables the team to work through the weaknesses in our strengths. After all, we're one team, one fight. In the end, I trust that I've given my soldiers the proper tools and training in order for them to trust their abilities, to make risks and accept failures. My soldiers are comfortable with asking questions and they will seek answers by networking. They will find whoever they need to in order to get the answers. Okay. I'm Staff Sergeant Alexander Miller, a 12 Bravo Combat Engineer with Triple Nickel Engineer Brigade. In my squad, we treat each other like a family. I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of great leadership appointed over me and great team leaders that I've been able to lead. And because of this, I'm a, I'm, it allows me to focus on mentoring and developing my squad. The leadership appointed over me has never let me down. They have given me the right tools and guidance so I could be a successful squad leader. I couldn't be successful without my team leaders. They are the first ones to deal with any problem that arise or any situation that may come about. A team leader has a rigorous and difficult job, in my opinion, one of the hardest jobs there is in the Army. They are the first ones to interact with the soldiers. They maintain the cohesive bond with the soldiers, and they're able to take time out of their day to talk with the soldiers in a group or one-on-one -on -one discussion about unit problems, personal problems, any problem that there is. And because of this, we're we're able to combine our talents in my squad where one's weakness can overcome, or one strength could overcome one's weakness. The family atmosphere in my squad keeps them motivated so they just don't go through the motions and just do what they, they're told to do like an NCO tells them to. They actually want to learn and strive to find out why they're doing something. A lot of this is because of the great models I've had that made me what I am today. I joined the Army in 2013, all the way to present, I still have more role models that come in every day in my life. These ama amazing leaders taught me so many great lessons. One, an example of that is one of my squad leaders. When I first joined the Army, Staff Sergeant Kentucky, I was a horrible marksman. But I never touched a weapon in my life until I joined the Army. He sat out there at the zero range. It felt for like, it fell for about four or five hours. He showed me from buttstock to barrel, how to qualify, everything about there is everything there is about an M4. I took all the good and the bad and created my own style of leadership. And how my goal, now my goal, 
is to be like him, to be like the role models that I met. I want to watch my soldiers grow through the ranks as I did and one day train a squad of their own. I take a lot of pride in my squad, and if they ever need me day or night, on duty or off duty, I'll be there no matter what. And if I ever have to be recognized for my accomplishments, don't look at the badges, tabs, or ribbons that I wear. Just look at my squad. Morning. My name's Staff Sergeant Thomas Hahn, and I'm here representing the 1-2 SBCT Ghost Brigade. And the reason I'm sitting before you today on this panel is because of my focus on preparation. As a weapon squad leader, my bread and butter are gun team crew drills. You know, we spend hours taking our 240s from bipod to tripod and then back again. You know, we make sure that our weapons, our tripods, our nods, they're PMCS, they're cleaned. You know, we, we do that both before and after training. You know, and as a result of this preparation, you know, my weapon squad has two fully qualified gunners, qualified AGs, and all of this is happening, you know, first time goes. They get up onto the lane, they shoot, they're experts, and then we go home. And when we go to like our live fire ranges and things like that, the more tactical training situations, we go out there, we set up our support by fire positions, and we're able to put effective fires down range so our maneuver elements can move in and seize the objective and meet that commander's intent. And I'm confident that should we end up on a two-way range somewhere, that they're going to take those same lessons learned and accomplish the mission. And you know, the job of a squad leader, it's a constant cycle of training and mentorship. And if you're a prepared squad, you know that you're never actually done preparing. And that is my squad. Good morning. My name is Staff Sergeant Gabriel Christensen. <clears throat> I'm a 15 Tango UH-60 Blackhawk Repair, and I am here on behalf of 16th Combat Aviation Brigade. I have the honor of speaking with you all today, as I was chosen amongst a pool of my peers by my leadership to represent what leadership qualities I display. I don't believe that I do anything extraordinary, though. I do what is right. And let me give you a few examples of that. I made a personal commitment to do what was right as a squad leader, as an 18-year-old private, because that wasn't the kind of squad leader I had had. I took plenty of notes and constructed in my mind what type of an NCO I would want to be when that day came. Communication is, is essential to the success of any unit, and I fully believe that alongside with my persistence, my ability to communicate accurately and effectively is primarily why I'm here today. The ability to lead through clear and concise communication is a dying trait in today's NCOs. To drive into your soldiers why you are conducting the mission you are doing, or what it will accomplish for the unit. Or when it comes to their personal problems, allowing them to voice their concerns no matter how large or small the problem, and formulating exactly how you're going to react. The next topics I would like to discuss is having patience in training and mentoring my soldiers. We are the tip of the spear when it comes to accomplishing a unit's mission, and our way of ensuring that is by dedicating effort, is by dedicating effort into molding our soldiers into everything we need them to be. I think about how much I'm actually affecting their development, whether that be in a convoy, at a range, or in an NCOPD. That means taking a moment, pausing for a deep breath, and assessing the deficiencies of each and every one of my soldiers. That way I can inform them on how they can improve their performance vastly. An example of how communication and understanding can improve a soldier's performance and form outstanding results is one particular rotation that I had to the Yakima Training Center in 2017. I was assigned as a downed aircraft recovery team in COIC, and while I had a highly undermanned team, I had also not received a proper brief of operations in the area at the time. Thankfully, with my knowledge of what is required to recover a downed aircraft, I was able to make up a plan on the fly. The battalion standard for mustering uh, and launching for recovery of an aircraft was 17 minutes, or an hour, excuse me, and my team performed it in 17 minutes. From relaxing in cots, to an on-site begin recovering recovery operations. Um, this was all accomplished by explaining to my soldiers the importance of staging go bags, prepping their equipment, and readying their weapons in order to expedite the manifesting and execution, showing them the importance of operating the way that we do and why we do it. I believe that I have the opportunity to speak with you all today because the few leaders who saw potential drove me to grow and develop leadership traits that I sought. I would just like to express um, a, a 
feeling or a thank you, excuse me, to the current command team over in Delta Company 2158th Assault Helicopter Battalion. Good morning. I'm Sergeant Shiler McIntyre, a member of Battle Company 117 Infantry Buffaloes, 2nd Striker Brigade Combat Team. I've served as a team leader, a squad leader, and currently a platoon sergeant. In the Buffalo Battalion, you will hear the phrase, we are part of the herd. The term herd is the Buffalo's core values. We are honorable, energetic, reliable, and disciplined. It is the hallmark of the Buffalo Battalion, how we are recognized, and a set of values that, helped, that have helped my squad be successful. I became a weapons squad leader shortly before deploying to the National Training Center. Through countless repetitions on, of gun drills, my squad demonstrated its lethality by preventing another platoon from being ambushed. We destroyed two enemy maneuver squads and two enemy personnel transport vehicles. We quickly became the company's weapon squad of choice for a variety of missions. After getting back from NTC, we went straight into the second Striker Brigade Combat Team's expert infantry and expert soldier badge training, which my squad received recognition by the brigade as the best squad for having the highest percentage of candidates earning their coveted badges. Five soldiers in my squad earned their expert infantry badge and one soldier earned his expert soldier badge. We were able to do this by maximizing time on lanes. We always tried to be the first ones on the lanes and the last ones to leave. I am thankful for a squad that was so extraordinarily motivated and eager to earn their badges. As a platoon sergeant, I have realized how vital the role of a squad leader is. The squad leader position has the greatest impact on junior enlisted soldiers and has the most influence on culture within a unit. I would like to thank Sergeant First Class Mitchell Birch for developing me into the leader I am today. The lessons he taught me and the level, the level of dedication he gave not to just me, but all of his soldiers is something I hope I show and pass on to all of my soldiers. I'll never forget what he said to me the day I pinned on my stripes. Now be the leader you always wished you had. Thank you for all the advice and mentorship, Sergeant First Class Birch. I would also like to thank my wife, who is also part of my squad and has shown me support in my career and continuously pushes me to be a better person every day. Thank you. Okay, hey, before we uh, turn it over to questions, let's give him a round of applause, all right? Let's give him a So for those of you that have never sat on a panel, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, I'm looking across the sea of really happy faces and you put, you know, you know, turn, stand up, Sergeant Major. This guy right here, like, yeah, seriously, stand up, turn around, face the camera. This is what the staff sergeants have to look at. <laughs> I mean, I, I can see why, I'm not nervous. You don't scare me. I'm just saying, you know, right now. But I can imagine what they're thinking. We got the quarter division, you know, we put all the really nice, friendly, happy people in the front. So um, I just, we got captains and majors and lieutenant colonels. I remember I was a staff sergeant, you know, lieutenant colonel and a major. They were like somebody else. Like, those are the old people. Now I'm like, man, you guys look really young. <laughs> It's like little babies. They got battalion commanders. They're awesome. Oh, uh, this just means it's like, Sergeant Major, you're just old. Um, but, hey, I just want to one more time thank staff sergeants and sergeants. I mean, imagine how hard that is. So I, I really appreciate your candor. Um, and I just wanted to say personally thank you, and I look forward to your questions, really hard questions. Please direct it kind of to one person instead of all. Uh, you can direct them at me, and I'll probably deflect to one uh, and maybe come off the top uh, with a, a different kind of way to look at things. So please uh, – uh, don't open it up for the entire panel because then we can get more questions as opposed to four people answering one question. Okay, over to the crowd or Facebook Live or anything else that we got going on today. That's me. I'll start off the group. Question. Okay. Um, the reason we have a, you have to talk in the microphone because we are going Facebook Live, and uh, I just want to make sure they hear what you're asking us. Okay. May, the question is directed at you, but I, I'd be interested to hear some feedback as, as we go through this. So one common thing I noticed um, from the entire panel, each one of them speaking, was their, uh, the reliance on commitment versus uh, compliance. 
Not once did they say I, they did something because they were told to do it or they had to do it or they were required to do it. Most of, most of the comments were directly related to them wanting to do it, them being inspired them themselves, them being committed. And many times in the Army, we, we think we're doing things because we have to do them, because we're required. And while there are things we're required to do, the real good units and the real good leaders do things because they're committed to doing it. So I, I'm interested in your, your thoughts about compliance versus commitment. Okay, uh, I'll give you a quick thought, and then um, we'll go with Sergeant Miller. You, you're a follow-up on this, okay? So I'll give you some time to think about commitment versus uh, compliance. I, I truly believe great units are committed. And that gives them, and when, and it, and it kind of leads to a different word we hadn't talked about, is trust. So if I'm in a very compliant organization, I, I – now, don't get me wrong. I'm a big rule follower. Anybody, you know, I was a course our major here, so you know that I like to follow the rules. Um, so, but that's not the point. Uh, so, in a compliance organization, you, you, you're not going to go outside the rules, no matter what. So, I know, because if I don't, I don't trust the leaders above me that if I, if I did it for all the right reasons, whatever that decision was, if I didn't do that right, I would be fired or I'd get in trouble. That's compliance. When I'm committed, I've been given guidance, and I trust that if I actually had to make the decision, go left or right, that in a committed organization, the leadership is going to say, why did you do that? And you're going to explain that, and they're going to go, okay, it makes sense. In a compliance organization, you went left, I told you to go right, what happens? You're fired. You're out of here. I want a new one. So we want to build a committed organization that's founded in a cohesive team that's built in trust. So if you do that for all the right reasons, you know, you're not going to get this. And I'll give you one very quick example. I was in uh, Grafenwehr, Germany. I'm an artillery guy. And uh, for some reason, not for some reason, howitzers kept getting flipped as we are doing air assault. So the, the rigging rules were very strict. You had to rig it this way. And I said, well, I'm going to put the co gun tube cover on the, the thing, and I'm going to fly it so that the, the chains don't get wrapped around, you know, the hand wheel. And in a compliance, you know, like, hey, you're fired. You didn't follow the rigging rules. Uh, in a committed, they said, hey, we understood exactly why you made that decision based off the conditions that you had, and it made sense. You're trying to prevent something. Does that make sense how you go from a compliance to committed? And I had the trust of my leaders that if I kind of did it for all the right reasons, I wasn't going to be punished for that. Does that explain difference? Okay, Sergeant, Sergeant Miller. Yes, that's amazing. I'm going to do my best to answer it on how I saw it. Um, so I see it as like for a medic yearly, that to go back and research everything, redo with all the medical, make sure they're still proficient in it because things change constantly. Now it keeps you in compliance. So it's for those updated things, like before we used to do something by walking straight, turn left, well, we change it to right because it makes more sense. So it's those things, new things come up, and staying compliance is, to me, someone higher above me found a better way to do something, and he's gonna reteach me through the way. Sorry. All over the place right now. <laughs> I already know that. Like I said, but we got this guy up front. He's scaring me a little bit. So, so. Yeah. Compliance is you're going back yearly. Make sure that you're still within the guidelines that you are given to. Then commitment are committed. You're doing it because it's the right thing, not just because the leader told you to. He already taught you how to do the right thing and the reasons why you did the, why you do that. And I think that's my answer. Okay. <laughs> my bad. Okay. Good. Next question. Right now, uh, Ken Irizarry says, I'd like to hear how one of the sergeants had a difficult situation in their squad and how they resolved it. So uh, the first one. Okay. We just got to pick on somebody, Sergeant Christensen. You got something? Difficult situation in your squad. And how did you resolve that? I have one, Sergeant Major. Um, there was a soldier uh, last year who was a PFC in, in my squad. Um, and 
every, every weekend, you know, you go around for your oak tree counselings or you ask your soldiers what they're doing for their weekends, how, you know, what their plan is, if they have a plan, where they're going out, who they're going out with, yada, yada, yada. And I had a, a PFC who, who looked different than normal. You could tell there was something off about the presence or, or how they were acting. Um, so I called the soldier over and I asked what was going on or what their plan was for the weekend. Um, I said, you know, are you going to play video games? Are you going to go out drinking with your friends? What's your, what's your plan? What are you doing? And the, the soldier looked at me and said, Sergeant, I'm, I'm going to play video games in my barracks room, and I'm, I'm not going to leave for, like, the next few months. I'm just going to play video games. And I said, that's kind of odd. I don't know why you wouldn't leave for a few months. What's, are, you, are you sick? Are you, not, are you feeling depressed? Is there anything you'd like to discuss with me? And he had explained that he had fallen into a, a, a financial scam on, online and had been in debt about twenty thousand um, dollars, which obviously that's a huge, huge shocker to me. Um, but through communication with a few of my other uh, team leaders in the squad, I was we were able to to figure out you know who, who was using his information, how he had fallen into the scam, and contacted a few banks to figure out how much of the money he could return, um, or or what would be the steps moving forward from that. And we were able to get him. Uh, he had spent some of the money. So we were able to get him a loan from that bank to, to pay off what he had owed um, and get him back financially responsible. And uh, to this day, he's doing, he's doing very well for himself. So I, I think that's a phenomenal answer. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight in that, what he said was, he looked different. You can't, you can't get that from a text, an email, even a phone call. Um, and I actually say this all the time. It, you have to look people in the eye. I, I really, you know, can't make that stuff up. I just the way he said that story is, there's so many cases where we go, oh, we didn't see it. That's what it means to be in my squad. You look people in the eye and you go, I don't know what's going on, but something's different. Um, and a lot of times we're missing that. They don't just walk up and tell you. But you, if you know your squad, like you said, and you take them out to lunch and dinner, you share some time, and then all of a sudden something changes, you notice that change in your squad. That could be your battalion commander. It could be your sergeant major. We all need that. Um, and, and I just want to re remind everybody, if you don't know your people, you're going to miss those things when they look a little different today. I think that's a great example. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, we got a we got a cat. You know, the lieutenant's going to ask the really hard questions here. No, that's in a good. Minute. Uh, question, Staff Sergeant Ruiz. You talk about identifying the strengths and weaknesses inside your squad, uh, and then building that community within them, helping the people that have those strengths, identifying those weaknesses, and putting them over there. As you've been doing this, do you see your soldiers under you building their own squads and doing the same thing and replicating what you've built and extending out? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, go ahead. Not so much building their own squads, but they're working well together. So, like, you know, I'll pair someone up. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess, I, my drill sergeant days. I used to have some people just were, or trainees weren't coordinated. A simple left face or a right face, they could not do. And as much as you sit there and, you know, go through it, I mean, it's 10 weeks and the train keeps moving. And um, one thing that I noticed about my trainees is they would see the way our drill sergeants work together. Although, yes, we were first platoon or second platoon, as all in the company, all the drill sergeants work together. So they started seeing that and emulating it within the platoons. They will go out to other platoons and they would get together and rehearse a left face or a right face. You know, those soldiers that were really proficient at DNC will team up. Or even soldiers who were really good at running or doing push-ups, sit-ups, they'll get paired up together and help one another out. Um, in the end, they're able to graduate, which is the end state for them. That was their main goal. They were all able to graduate. So, well, sir, I, I think uh, you know what you said was no, but your answer was yes, um, because if in my squad, if they emulate you, I think your question is, are they building more squads like that? 
when they emulate you, in my opinion, they are going out and building other squads. And we, we did this one other time in another panel, the only other time we've done this panel. And that's what we've seen where the team leader starts emulating what the squad leader is doing. And I think if the other drill sergeants or the privates are emulating, I think they are building other squads that we want. But All right, so this isn't directed at the uh, panel, but so, so I appreciate your question. Um, and if, if you heard the question, um, are you a commander, sir? Yes. All right, so uh, young captain up there asked uh, what they're – how they're training the soldiers and then the soldiers under them are, uh, are creating their own squad. I would just remind all of us, uh, we have a responsibility as leaders. Everybody in this room, you can sit down, sir. Um, in, the, in the sense of, hey, we're putting a lot of, lot of stuff on the squad leaders' shoulders, right? And our young team leaders. But uh, we have a responsibility to develop them. All right? And so remember, you're two le levels down. All right, how are we all right, providing oversight for our junior leaders? Okay? Uh, and it starts with you. It starts with me. All right, your two leaders uh, levels down as well as mine. So we need to, to make sure, we need to know from you, you know, what we can do to help you. Because um, you don't have all the answers. And we, we've identified a gap, right, uh, in development and leadership, right? And we, and we did that, senior leaders. Uh, and we, we've been busy for a lot of years. Um, and the star majors started, this is my squad, pretty important, okay? But it's not just on you. We own this, okay? And so I think all of us in here uh, have to figure out, one, uh, what is this, what is, uh, being like, this is my squad. I mean, it starts with you, you looking in the mirror every day, right? Because you're part of that squad, okay? So you have to be not just compliant. You have to be committed. I have to be compliant and committed, okay? What am I doing every day to make sure our young squad leaders, all right, are providing sound leadership for our sons and daughters, all right? And there were some comments up here. Hey, I didn't get, I didn't, you know, I didn't get a timeline. I didn't get a brief, but I executed, right? So there's some risk in there. So, again, we own risk, leaders. Um, I would just tell you, before we ask squad leaders, what are you doing about it and what are your junior leaders doing, remember what our responsibilities are and how we can help uh, build. Because we talk about teams of teams, now we're talking about squads of squads. And we're all part of a squad, multiple squads, right? Whether it's our army, right, our service squad, or our family squad, as you talked, the SMA talked about, and uh, so did Sergeant Christian. So um, I appreciate you guys being here. It's really exciting uh, to see how mature you guys are. And uh, thanks for what you do. Um. So I'm actually going to ask the hardest question. Is that okay? And then hopefully we can get something from online. So I'm going to ask two panel staff starting on, and we're going to go down in the end. So two. So what are you? What was your greatest impediment to being the squad leader that you want to be? For me, Sergeant Major, I, sometimes I have the tendency to kind of get in my own way a little bit, I'll maybe overthink a problem and not kind of see that the solution is, is right there in front of my face. So for myself personally, it'll require just kind of taking a step back from whatever the, um, the situation is and taking a minute to look more clearly on, on that situation and then just executing. Okay. I'll be more, I didn't, uh, maybe I wasn't specific enough. <laughs> So we got some really great leaders in this room at the appropriate level. What could they do uh, re to remove some of the impediments to help you be a better squad leader? I'll let you think about it. Oh, I'm ready, Sergeant Major. And then we'll go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> but go ahead, go ahead then. Don't, don't let me slow your roll down. So the thing that <laughs> I need as a squad leader from my senior leadership is just presence, just kind of be there for me and just kind of be a, a sounding board. Because it's, you know, I know that at my level, I don't know everything. And I know that people above me, they tend to know more. So just what I need from my senior leadership is just be there and, like, listen to me and okay. provide, uh, you know, feedback. Okay. Um, I totally, totally agree with Staff Sergeant Hahn over here. Um, working one level up and now two levels up, there's – a lot of things that I don't fully understand and I'm trying to learn as I go. So having that, that senior leader presence that's been there, already done that, uh, that's a great contributing factor to, to helping um, be successful in that position. Sorry, Major. Okay. But you can't carry out what, what's one impediment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't let them off the hook. You guys don't let me off the hook. I mean, okay. Go ahead. 
one impediment, one, one thing, if you were king for a day, what would you make better and fix and say, this would just put it over the top to make me the best staff sergeant, platoon sergeant in the world? Um. <clears throat> Besides giving you seven rank and pay, okay. <laughs> I just have to refer back to the, the presence, Sergeant Major. I mean, like senior leader presence, um, involvement, um, just making sure that. So the implication is that they're not present. Well, I mean, they are. But <laughs> so, no, they, they yeah, are. you see what I mean? I'm saying uh, uh, that's why I'm asking is one thing that's missing that you don't have right now, or you say it's perfect. That's what I'm saying is, that's what I'm trying to look for. Maybe there's stuff we need to change or not. Yeah. So okay, there we go. Sorry, Marie's. There you go. Sorry, would, you had two shots at this, <laughs> brother. I got a lot to say, Sorry, Major. <laughs> Sorry, Major, I'm going to uh, definitely say the mentorship. Actually sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, and I, sometimes it's expected of us to know, and sometimes we don't know any better. You know, we get so wrapped up on the day-to-day -day things that, a situation might happen and I might think, hey, this is the proper way to do it. That's me thinking. But again, it's, it's that um, you have senior leaders who have gone through that situation and they've gone about it a different way that worked and just sharing that knowledge, that way we don't continue to do the same mistakes over and over again. And again, just getting that feedback with that mentor, sitting down one-on-one -on -one and actually talking, whether it's job related, whether it's my career, um, on a personal level, that one on one time major. Okay. Now they're all raising their hands. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Sarah. But So it's a, uh, I also kind of feel like the, with the NCOERs and things like that, a lot of the times it's really, it's made to make the soldier look good and it's not, it's not necessarily honest. So it's a, uh, too many times it's, you know, and people, you know, they get promoted on the strength of these NCOERs. So it's, they're written in such a way to make the soldier look good and just don't provide honest feedback. And I think that honest feedback, on my, I don't need to know that I'm, you know, the best squad leader you know, on JBLM. If I'm not the best squad leader on JBLM, if I'm doing something wrong, then I want to know that I'm doing something wrong. And I think that my NCOER should reflect. And I think everybody's NCOER should reflect their performance. Okay. Uh, before I answer that <laughs> or talk about that, was, uh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, sorry, Major. It was just, I, if, I guess for myself, rewarding that question, I guess would be a hindrance. Okay, um, sure. Would be uh, micromanagement. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine line to take what Staff Sergeant Hahn said about, um, you know, a lack of, of presence with your soldiers, but you can have as much presence as you want, but let them do their job. Let, let the squad leaders act as squad leaders. Let me struggle a little bit, and when I need to reach out to you, I'll reach out to you if you're there for me. And I think there's that fine line of you being there, having the knowledge and having your presence, and then let, seeing me struggle a little bit. And then when I lean over and say, hey, can you give me a hand? What is this? What do I do with this? I've never dealt with you know, this divorce or a soldier's death or, or debt that they're experiencing. I, I need to understand what I can tell my troops. That's the fine line that needs to be walked, and I think that's the, the most hindering thing we experienced our major okay um that's those are really good points um and i'll talk um both a little bit uh, just very quickly about the ncoer um i'm actually not going to disagree with you too much now um you know before we changed why did we change from the old ncoer to the one we have now because every ncoer was what one one. everybody was one and one you know Everybody was the best squad leader we've ever seen over and over and over and over. So we actually, that's the reason you have the top 24%. It's because of that exact example that everybody was one and one. And then once upon a time in a former position, not the Sergeant Major of the Army, um, we had a Sergeant Major that got a two. And he's all fired up. He's just mad. And he was just, you know, he came to me and he's like, why did I get a two? I've always had a one-on-one. -on -one. I said, I looked at him. I was giving him a little mentorship one-on-one. -on -one. And I said, um, have you ever been a battalion sergeant major before? No. It's like, okay. This is the first time you do it. It's not bad. 
you know, you're not, we're not kicking you out of the Army tomorrow. Uh, so it takes two ways. So when people do give you honest feedback, be receptive and say, how can I be better? Don't be mad at it. So um, that's actually why we changed the NCRR, get top 24%, because of some of the things we just kept giving everybody was the best, and it was hard for the panel members to understand. So uh, part of me says, yes, I think we do need to be honest. We need to look people in the eye and say, hey, you know, you're not doing well. It's not bad. It's not good. It's that we're trying to help you get better. Um, that's number one. Very quickly on the two, and the, uh, let them struggle a little bit. That's the hardest thing for everybody in this room to do. Uh, and it's hard as a leader. You know, I'll give you one example. Um, I'm not going to tell you, but it was a senior general officer. We'll say three or four stars so you won't be able to figure it out. So one day we're on an installation, and somebody said, Sir, I need coveralls, you know, for my organization. And then that the general officer started talking about his time. I remember when we had that problem. I was a commander, and I went down there, and I told that CIF, we're going to give coveralls to my unit. And they got coveralls. And he goes, we're going to go back, and we're going to talk to your leadership, we're going to get you some coveralls. I didn't say anything. We got in the van. I said, uh, sir, is that, is that really something you need to do? He's like, Sergeant Major, what do you mean? I said, well, the story you gave was the commander, the captain. You solved that at the company battery troop level, not at the four-star general level. We could. I mean, I'm telling you, this guy says give coveralls. That unit, they would have had coveralls in 10 minutes. <laughs> that was going to happen. But was that what we needed to do for the goodness of the organization? Should the... Should we let the company commander solve that problem? Uh, that's, that's the conversation we had. And I think it's sometimes we, you know, we get really, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the exact same way. I want to dive in, uh, and it's hard to say I'm not going to answer that. That's the hardest thing in the world as a leader to say I'm not, because the person that really needs to answer that is your first sergeant. Um, and that takes that comes with risk too, right? Like, hey, Sergeant Major Army, did you know about that? Yes, I did. Did you do anything? No, but I didn't think I needed to. And who solved that? Well, this person did. Okay, is that appropriate? So I acknowledge there's some risk to letting you do that. But I agree to you. I agree with you that we may need, as a leader, we need to take that risk in order for you to grow. And I just want to give you that quick example. Okay, yes. All right, next question from uh, online. How do you keep a soldier within your squad who has a negative attitude toward the Army from affecting your squad's morale or attitude? How do you prevent him or her from damaging the other soldier's perspective of the Army? Okay, it's our military. So there are some soldiers out there that do have a negative attitude. They came in, they just do not want to be there. <laughs> It happens. Sometimes they just made it in and wiggled by. But you have to work with them. You have to sit there with them, sit down, have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Do you want to be here? And he's going to tell you yes or no. Most of the time, I've always, they always said yes. Then I had the team leader hand walk them everywhere, make sure that attitude kind of changes, see if it changes through mo certain ways of motivation. Either maybe he's really into PT. He likes to get competitive with the other squad members and that motivates my squad at least we're all physically fit and we like to compete with the other squads something that motivates them and kind of changes their attitude around motivation is the biggest thing i believe what do you think sergeant christian uh sorry just as as sergeant miller had said uh that, that upfront questioning of of do you want to be here um is is a good identifier of the situation um and then the assessment of each underlying reason of why that soldier responds the way they do. Yes, I do want to be here because I like the fact that we do PT like this every single day <clears throat> or we change it up or whatever it might be. Or no, you don't like being here because, <coughs> excuse me, um, because you're not released for Chow the DFAC at 1129 or, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it might be that that soldier doesn't like, you need to identify those those factors so you can Fix what you can, and if you can't fix anything, um, identify methods to, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
find out what drives that soldier. Find out, find out what, what you're doing wrong, if you're doing anything wrong, and if you're not doing anything wrong, what you can do with that person. Okay. Uh, and that's fair because it's really hard. Actually, uh, at the end, you've answered, I would say, why did you join the Army? You know, at some point in time, you know, I liked it. You know, I was with recruiters yesterday. I'm, nobody had a gun. You know, they're just like, you're joining the Army tomorrow. So there's got to be some reason why you were propensed to join the military and find out that why and see if you can motivate them that way. But if not, you know, you, you keep – the biggest thing that you can control, in my, th- in my opinion, in that situation is your attitude. You got to say, I mean, I said this all the time. I said, you know, it's great. You know, I love you to the day you're leaving the army, but it's time for you to leave out of my army. Um, but I did. I had people, you know, they separated the army and they called me later. I said, well, you're, you're gone. So, but no, oh, I really appreciated that. I, I would, I, you know, sometimes I'd literally give them a hug and say, okay, see you later. It's time for you to go. But it was about controlling my attitude. And I think when you control your attitude, um, even when somebody else has a bad attitude, you just you you can't control that. Sometimes you ask them why they came in, but the bet the only thing that you can do is how you approach it. Um, and I I think that's probably for me was the most important thing that I went through. Okay, next. Keep your hands up. And just say, oh, I can only stretch so far. He was in my squad before, so oh. there's several people in my room uh, that were in my squad. Several in this room. Cool. Absolutely, Sergeant Major. Um, I strongly believe that um, mission success is determined is not determined by luck, but by deliberate planning and being well rehearsed. Uh, what are some of you? I'll start with Sergeant Ruiz. What are some of your TTPs that makes your squad successful? I'm going to say uh, that goes back to like knowing your soldiers, um, knowing their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so it's pretty much identifying, um, identify a goal, a common goal. So if we're, for instance, we want to be the bestest one in post, what do we need to establish to get there? How can we get there? Um, what do we need to work on? It's just pretty much um, ensuring as well as that every soldier within my squad um, knows what their roles are, know what their duties are, um, that I've laid out everything and they completely understand um, their roles and duties. Um, I would say as well as uh, rehearsing. So going through it over and over um, and seeing the results after action reviews, actually talking about, hey, this is, this is our intent. This is what was supposed to happen. What actually happened? What happened? And how can we improve? What areas do we need to improve? Okay, Sergeant Hahn, we haven't heard from you in at least 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so, uh, for me, what, when it's time to train, then it's time to train. And like appointments don't happen when it's time to train. And for example, like today, it's you know it's Thursday morning, and I know that my squad. I didn't screw that up. Did I? Didn't I? Is it Sergeant Tom Tag? It's well, my squad has their rucks on anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. There so you it's, go. they're out there training, and uh, in the Tomahawk Battalion, uh, where I'm here from, it's you know our leadership makes it a point to protect Thursday mornings for us, so we can go out and do training. And I think that's that's the most important thing is. When it's time to train, then it's time to train, and everything else stops. Okay. Um, I'm going to come up um, a little differently. So deliberate versus luck. I believe, and one of the themes of in my squad is building a strong, cohesive team that's highly disciplined and fit. If something outside of what you plan for happens, a highly disciplined fit, trained at the basics team can adjust very quickly. If you don't know your job, you're not fit, you're not going to be able to adjust and say, okay, um, remember we used to those runs and you run past the battalion headquarters and then they run another mile. 
A few of us actually remember those days. Uh, it, used to be, it was a very common occurrence. But because we were disciplined and fit, it didn't matter if we ran another mile. But if you weren't fit, and then, you know, mentally, you just were crushed. You know, and it, you, how many times did you see all the people fall out when you run past the headquarters? You all in this room know exact that. Those weren't grounded. They weren't highly trained. They weren't disciplined and fit. Because mentally, they couldn't adjust because of those other deliberate actions that they had done over and over and over. And then all of a sudden, when something else came up, they're like, okay, well, that's not exactly what we trained for, but we're really good at this. We did a quick shift. Um, but if you're not grounded in those fundamentals, uh, it's really hard to shift from that. It's just like, well, I didn't know how to do this, so I definitely don't know how to do that. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just that hard. Uh, that's just my opinion that uh, I agree that through repetition and discipline over time um, builds cohesive teams that can be adaptive um, and not go, well, I hope that my cardio is going to be good enough. When I run past the headquarters, I hope I can make the run. Um, which leads to a question that people kept asking me. I said, how do you, you know, it was really up front. Like, how do you become the Sergeant Major of the Army? And I actually had to think about this for a little bit. And it's like, you know, was it luck? Or was, was it being highly trained and disciplined and fit for 32 years? When, when nobody was watching... Did I get up and do PT? When everybody else left the motor pool when I was a staff sergeant and they said, hey, we'll meet you at the headquarters, did I march everybody? When I was a drill sergeant, I took the AT4 uh, to the DFAC. When I was a first sergeant, the only way of getting out of Kosovo where you're going to run two, uh, two times uh, laps around Bonstill, that happened to be about 11 miles, um, was it all those years – and then doing that consistently day in and day out at the fundamentals, reminding myself that I'm going to be a soldier. I'm going to take the PT test. I'm going to qualify my weapon. And doing that every day for 32 years. And I think that's what gets you to be the Sergeant Major of the Army. And that's discipline, and you take a little bit of the luck out of it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Because he used to be in my squad, too. <laughs> All right, we've got a uh, question from online. Pretty pointed. Uh, as a squad leader, how do you deal with a team leader, a sergeant that has more time in service and thinks they are a better squad leader? Ooh, Any, does anybody have that before? Uh, probably the, the the young sergeant on the end. <laughs> I have actually dealt with that. So <laughs> um, I, it's kind of tricky because, I mean, if you're the same rank, you kind of view each other as, as peers, but. At the end of the day, if you're in that position, you have to own that position. And either by knowing your sol soldiers, like even if he's a peer, you, you just have to know what motivates them. And, and at the end of the day, let him know where he stands with you. Like, I am your squad leader. We might be peers. We might be, you know, same time in service. But I've been chosen for this position for a reason. Um, you know, it's no hard feelings, man, but like, this is what we have to do. And at the end of the day, they just have to realize that it, it's just, we're just trying to help the unit here. You know, so let's complete the next mission. Sergeant Christensen, have you run into that? It looks like you're shaking your head. Right, like, Sergeant Major, oh, yeah. I was uh, going off what Sar uh, Sergeant McIntyre said. Um, when I came to JBLM, um, I, I came to a battalion that was redeployed from Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> so a lot, it was during PCS season, a lot of people were leaving, so a lot of slots were open. Um, through my my resume uh, on who where I was going, no one really had any idea. But there was a position that opened for a staff sergeant, but I was an E5, a sergeant. So when I ended up filling that role, I, I had there's a there's my counterpart who was also another staff sergeant who was missing from that platoon. So essentially, I had to take over uh, supervising four other sergeants as a sergeant. And as Sergeant McIntyre said, that was a that was a conversation you have to have with them. So they understand what position is, um, you know. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of dude and man and why are you doing this to me, man and dude. And they, they need to understand that it's nothing personal to your peers. You're, you're in a position because you were selected for that, 
by your higher ups, whether whatever that was for, because you can run 30 seconds faster than the other sergeant or whatever it was that you were in that position for, they needed to understand that you're not exactly peers in that situation. Um, so that is, that's a hard, that's a very hard thing to deal with. Um, Sergeant Major, and that was, that was something he explained very well. Okay, Sergeant Maurice, you had something else? Sergeant Major, so it kind of happens when you're a specialist and you first pin on the strikes, uh, stripes. Um, so you have, you know, other fellow specialists and you're used to going out, um, you're used to interacting with them, you know, they're your buddies. And now you are a sergeant and in charge of them and how do we separate that? You know, it's, it's literally, I had to have a talk with uh, one of my specialists because we were close and I had to draw the line. Like, I'm responsible for you, I am your NCO now and just having that talk with him so that he understands like I'm your supervisor, I am your leader, you know, I'm responsible for you. And you know, now, you know, it's like simple as military bearings, customs and courtesies, like going to parade rest, going to um, attention when speaking to an officer, you know, the simple things that we do. And, it, and I told him, and it's gonna speak highly of you because when others see this, they see a disciplined soldier, you know, so having to address that and actually sitting down with the soldier. Yeah, I think um, in my career, that's probably one of the hardest things I've dealt with is having someone that had a lot more time in service and time in grade than you did. And you're the section chief, first sergeant, I don't know, battalion CSM, brigade CSM. It's really difficult. Um, and I think um, you've explained it real well, but one specific example is I was a drill sergeant and I had, a, you know, there's no honor mountains of ease with drill sergeants, right? You know, so your drill sergeant is a drill sergeant is a drill sergeant. But one day, uh, privacy did something that messed up and then the, the other drill sergeant rolled up the gun on him and then told the platoon guard to march him to chow. And for those of you that have forgotten what basic training was like, when you, when you roll up the gun on, you don't get to march yourselves to chow. That's the drill sergeant's job. So I'd run upstairs, I'd run down, and they're gone. I go, where'd the platoon go? And the drill sergeant goes, well, I told him to go march. I said, well, why'd you roll up the gun? And he goes, well, you know, I've been in the Army. Oh, you can't tell me. I said, hey, I, I really appreciate your time in service and time in grade. But for in, in the herd, it's about honor and discipline of the organization. And it's not about you and how much time in service you got. And that's what I explained to that drill sergeant is that it's not about my rank and how long I've been in and you're older and all this other stuff. It's about the organization. Um, he wasn't very happy with that, but I really stuck with uh, my answer. And I said, we are not going to do that. And that's really hard when it's someone that's got more time and time and grade. But my advice to you is stick to what you believe in. And don't come off that. You know, it's, it's really powerful. Uh, when you can do that and if you don't if you falter one time that's it you can, it's almost like you can never go back <laughs> it's like they'll, they'll keep doing it forever well, I'm older and it doesn't matter it's about the organization so I, I really like your answer but my only thing is stick to it uh, you know don't back down uh, and I know it's hard yes I think we have time one more <laughs> okay this question's for uh, Staff Sergeant Christensen so how do you balance uh, compassion for your soldier uh, and adherence to standards when something may happen in that soldier's life that is completely out of their control but is absolutely impacting their work performance? Hmm. I'm glad you asked him that question, not me. <laughs> that, uh, that's an outstanding question. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> so. I had a platoon sergeant uh, when I did get to um, JBLM that I was going through a divorce during PCS as well. So I had a lot of a lot of stress on my plate. And then on top of that, filling a position that was higher than what I was used to, um, I, I couldn't, I was overwhelmed at all, at all times throughout the day. Um, and so the compassion came from my platoon sergeant to where he, he, he was able to say, I see that you're competent. I see that you can do your job. And as a soldier, you've got that part of your life established. But there's there's something missing. 
from your total soldier concept, right? Your, your mind is not there from your personal experiences, and I need you to, to, to find that balance. So he would find ways to, to give me time throughout the day to where if I had to go to the court for paperwork or what have you, whatever was with my personal relationship, he would dismiss me to take care of that, knowing full well that I would come back ready to focus on work. He, he figured out how I could put small amounts into each and every section and balance myself to that that way I could get myself back on my feet. So I guess what I would wrap that up with is, is there is a f very specific talent that it takes to understand each and every one of your soldiers and have that compassion for them, but also understand the fact that they have a job to do, you have a job to do, and you need to find out how you can get yourselves right um, to find that balance to perform your, your, your best. <clears throat> I think that's a, a very good answer. And it's difficult, right? You know. Um, you got a job to do, but you, you know, um, here's, here's kind of what I've learned is that we can get through those times if we understand, you know, our people, okay, exactly what he said. And sometimes we, we just make these crazy rules. I'll, I'll use one as I was a course our major and, um, here and my staff sergeant outside says, Hey, I'd, I'd really like to be a, I want to be a recruiter. And I said, okay, well, you go next week. You, um, he needed to raise his GT score. He goes, but Sergeant Major, we, I'm it. It's like, you know, army of one. I said, we'll figure it out. I, you know, we will. There's plenty of people around us. I didn't have to bring anybody else in to do anything. But it was good for that person in that organization. Uh, and sometimes we all, in a cohesive team, we may have to give a team member some time in order to bring them back into the team and say, oh, it's not the good time. And the chief of staff has got a great chart. Um, if you haven't seen it, it says work-life balance. And, and that's where I would say to you, if, if soldiers are going through a hard time, that may be a one-time event, and we may need to take some time to let them have that one-time event, no matter where you're at. Um, over here on the one side of it, it says war, and the other side it says daily. On the bottom, it kind of shows that to you. Um, so are you at war? You may not, you gotta stay there, but if you're not, if something less than war, is that a one-time event? That could be one of those things. He's going through, I'm hoping that's a lifetime, only one divorce, maybe not two or three. But those are something that you may need to focus in on that time to bring those back. Would he be here today if we would have said, I don't care what you're going through. We're gonna go do this, right? Would you be here today? So we got to recognize that uh, and do exactly what his platoon sergeant did. Uh, so I, I think that's a great question to, to end on. Okay, let's give him a round of applause one more time, right? Um, you know, I'm really honored to be here today, and this is my second panel, and uh, this is my squad. And what I'd ask everybody in this room is to take – Take a quick note, look down and, you know, a couple of times and think about what it means to be in your squad. And then how do you take this out of this room and back to your organization? Do you sit down and talk with your squads, whoever those squads are? Did you spend time with them? Um, I got, I got the great joy of spending some time with a person in my squad, the Secretary of the Army, as we were going up to Alaska. Um, did you go take time and you walked in and you just had lunch together? There was no agenda. And you just said, hey, how's it going? Or tell me a little bit about. Tell me something you've never told me before. What's your hidden talent? Have you ever had lunch with me, you know, during a session? I always ask, what's your hobbies or your hidden talent? And that's the goal is to understand the people that are around you. Because you're, you're going to be amazed by what they're going to say. It's going to be completely amazing. You're going to find out something about the person sitting next to you that you never knew by saying that one question. What's your hobby? What's your hidden talent? That's what it means to be in my squad. So we know each other. So anything looks different. We know because we're, I mean, I was sitting there talking to him the other day and he said, man, I love violins. And you do, you love violins. Yeah, he has a violin. 
And he plays the violin, and then all of a sudden, you know, Sergeant Major Tripp says, I'm selling my violin, I'm done. I'm like, wait a minute, you just told me you love violins, you know, what's going on? But if you never knew that he loves this violin so much, you know, now it's on Facebook that you're going to love, you love your violin. <laughs> so, um, if you didn't know that, and he says, hey, I'm selling my violin. You're just like, okay, how much money are you getting for it? You see, that's, that's what it means to be in your squad. And then when you walk out of here, how do you, how do you set the example, you know, as a commander, as a platoon leader, as a platoon sergeant, as a first sergeant, as a sergeant major, that we take time with the people in our squad? Remember, that could be your family. That could be your battalion commander, your brigade commander, your Devardi commander. It could be your first sergeant. But it also could be your platoon sergeants. Um, and that's the positive aspects of being in my squad. I'm really proud of all of you. Thank, I want to thank the team, Sergeant Klutz, and uh, thank the Sergeant Major here and all the people in the back for putting this together. Um, I'll stick around for a couple minutes uh, not on Facebook Live to answer any questions that you may have. I'm really proud to be your 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, not the Sergeant Major of the Army. I'm your Sergeant Major of the Army. I'm proud to be that. Thank you. Oh, cool.